<laughs> right? Uh, it really does. So well, let's pray, and then we'll uh, jump in here. Like I said, we got three weeks, and then uh, uh, we'll be all set on this. Lord, uh, thanks for being so good uh, to your people. And Father, um, we just don't deserve uh, even a portion of the grace that you extend. And Father, I just pray tonight that, um, as usual, that you would just completely take me out of the way. Um, let not anything said be of uh, my mindset <clears throat> or of my will, Lord, but uh, I just pray that everything would be about you, uh, about your son, and about your word. And so, Father, I just pray that you would give me the grace um, to uh, discern what you have for us to discern and that you would open the minds of those in the class and let them hear from you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so we've been cruising through the Old Testament. I've been thinking about this a lot, and I, I do appreciate you guys. Uh, a lot of you reached out, and uh, my wife is uh, doing better, and uh, so she's just going through some funky stuff, and so, you know, and even had her asking questions of, you know, you know, just naturally like, what did I do wrong to deserve this? <laughs> and I just told her, hey, you know what? I would look at this as the glass half full. What are you doing right right now? You know, she's, you know, she's involved with me on you know, marriage mentoring. She's discipling women, and so I would say, you know what? I would look at this as uh, you're getting in the way of the, of the devil. And so, uh, you know, don't look at this as a glass half empty. Look at it as a glass half full. And so, uh, she perseveres through that. And I appreciate it. So, yeah, Miss Alexi. <laughs> and she hates when I call her out like that. So. But, um, but yeah, so. As we've been coming through the Old Testament, uh, you know, we've made it here to Chronicles. Again, uh, we'll find uh, parallels to other books in the Bibles, First and Second Kings and uh, Samuel. You're going to see the same stories that show up. But I just want to remind you guys as we get started tonight that all of this Bible is just an account and a reaccount of history and prophecy of a very basic storyline, which is God in his story, right, moves and everything we see that comes against God is the devil trying to counter that move and so the Bible is actually pretty easy to figure out because if you want to see how does the devil counterfeit well then you go and see what it is that God is doing I, I was doing a study and it was a re really good examination of the idea if you ever wanted to study out what is the Antichrist going to be like um, you can go study out Nimrod at the Tower of Babel all the way back in Genesis 10. Because you have a guy who was a political ruler of a one world system with one language and one religion. And you see the similarities, if, if, and it, all it is, is uh, the storyline of what he's going to be like. And if you want to know how the devil imitates, well, you look at what God does. God is a triune being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When you get to Revelation, you're going to be introduced into the triune deity, if you will, of the Antichrist, uh, the beast, and the false prophet, right? He has his own trinity. Paul writes about the idea that uh, he has his own church. He has his own synagogue. He has his, um, it was called the uh, ministers of Satan. So everything God is doing throughout this book as we are learning, always ask your question uh, this way is, where is God moving in this story? Where is God moving with his people and with me? And then start looking for, and where is the devil moving against this? Because it's always that. As God's people start to move, the devil comes against. And you usually see that in the form of other nations or through judgment, stuff like that. And you see a really clear picture of that in the book of Job. Because you see God moving, blessing Job. And then you see the <clears throat> devil coming to move against that, and then you see how we play out in that storyline. But <clears throat> as we move into Chronicles, I, like I said, I don't even know why this hit me today. I asked my wife, I said, you know what, I, I watched this, this preview in the clip, and you guys will know it because it's from a movie you've probably seen. And I'm like, holy smokes, if this just does not spell out the movement of God and Satan and that whole thing going on behind the pictures, we do know that when we're born into this world, we're born, what? We're born blind. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to him that are lost. Well, God isn't trying to hide anything, right? So, so we got to ask the question, well, if God's trying to get people saved, well, the devil moves against that, so he's trying to hide that truth. We know that he hides the light, he hides those things. 
Verse 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine into them. And so it's this battle of God moving. A, a guy, a girl sits in church, man, they're starting to hear some things, and the Spirit is working in them, and then the devil comes in to shut that down and says, well, that's foolishness, that's dumb, that's hate speech, that's this. And you see that battle over the... Um, souls of men is what it comes down to and so the devil plays a very active part in blinding you before you're saved and even to an extent after you're saved because you have to take the time and discipline and kill your flesh to the point where i'm not going to give in to the desires of what i want to do i am going to get up early stay up late and i'm going to get into the book and see what god has to reveal to me so that i can know Right, because otherwise, what happens is, is we just go through life and we live in a semi-blinded state. We may have come to the point where we get saved and we understand that Christ is our Savior, but then discipleship starts to move in, and the devil still comes and gets you. Gets you. He may have lost the war when it comes to your soul, but he knows that you're still a what? You're still a figure in the battle, and so he wants to take you out of that battle so that you're not effective to get the next person out of his keep, right? So just because he's lost you, he knows that you can have an impact, and he doesn't want you to be a part of that. So uh, we're going to play this movie clip, and think about this, like I said, uh, I don't think the Bible plays out exactly like this movie clip to a degree, um, but it is really, really interesting, the terminology they use when you just substitute in the idea of God and Satan moving between each other. Do you want to know what it is? The matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave in you. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. <coughs> you take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Again, I don't believe the Bible is made up of a mathematical computer simulation world that the Matrix was ideally <laughs> presented. But how many of you guys remember that movie? Right? And I watched that clip today, and I'm just thinking to myself, if this is not our world and our church today, um, you know, we are born as slaves to sin. Um, we are powerless in that. We can find confirmation, like I said, in verse 4 here, that the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe, right? And so here's what Jesus Christ has always told. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so Hollywood doesn't get many things right. 
they get love stories and I think this because you know with love stories you know pick the one every girl every guy you know they want that guy that will try you know try you know transverse the entire planet to get to his girl right and so in that aspect that's how actually you know our marriages and our love life should be but in this world here like I said they don't get many things right but the idea that we are blinded to what this world and what the God of this world has for us has never been more prevalent. The running into the arms of apostasy and abominable things that even forget 40 years ago that we would have thought incomprehensible five or 10 years ago that not only is the world shoving at us and our kids, our churches by lack of not knowing any different are embracing a lot of this culture. And so, you know, I, I think Jesus stands there, and it is interesting in Revelation chapter 3, he talks about the Laodiceans, and he talks about the fact that they should apply eye salve to their eyes so that they can see, and it's a picture of the Bible. And so, you know, I really do believe Jesus Christ stands at the door and knocks and says, hey, listen, all I offer you right now is the truth. Are you ready for the truth? Because there's no going back. <clears throat> Once you understand... It's me moving and the devil countering, and you are part of a large chessboard. What side are you going to be on? There is no going back when you choose sides. If you do it, excuse me, if you do it right. Now you can meander in the middle and play you know, what we call, um, you know, casual Christianity and just be a spectator. But if you're going to be on the board, if you're going to be on the game, uh, in the game, you have to know the players and what is going on. And that's a long ways back into where we're going with Chronicles, but Chronicles like Samuels and Kings is a picture of the millennial reign of Christ. We're going to talk a little bit more. I'm going to give you guys little fragments of what that, and we'll get to the back side of the page. We'll talk about that some more. But I just felt like this week, like I said, I don't know in the environment that we live now that I can't impress upon you guys enough that you know your only weapon in this fight is the one you barely pick up in a lot of cases. And Hebrews 4 tells us that the Word of God is, is like a two-edged sword. And so I would just challenge you tonight that you better get used to using your sword because you're going to get lost in a world and a church system that is going to tell you things that don't line up with what the Bible says, and you need to know where your line in the sand is because they are going to drag you quickly down the beach and you're not going to know how you got here and you're seeing it with you know all the stories in the news of you know this big church and that big church falling apart and this kind of stuff and it goes back to their doctrine you know it goes back to you know they're they're, they're just not buying into what the bible says has to be abiding so <clears throat> proverbs 35 with that in mind says that every word of god is pure uh proverbs uh, 30 verse 5 said every word of god is pure he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. So again, there is this tendency to say, I barely get the New Testament. I don't even have time for the Old Testament. Well, you need to make time or you're going to find yourself not in a place where you understand the whole counsel of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 says, All scripture, not some, not the New Testament, not just Paul's writings, but all, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for several things, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. And I like the way um, the KJV works is, he, it says, thoroughly furnished unto all good, good works. Now your dictionaries will say archaic, old English, this kind of stuff. But there is a difference between thoroughly, T-H-O, and T-R or T-H-R. And the idea of thoroughly is this idea is, uh, the dictionary will tell you that you receive God's word in a way that penetrates you or actually goes through you. So you can understand things about the Bible, but what Paul's telling Timothy is, if you really want to get this, this thing can't just be a part of understanding what you know. It's got to get in you. And it's got to change you from the inside out. So even though that seems like semantics, for me, that is a key word to understand that thoroughly is, is, is much more intentful of a word of what Paul's trying to paint of a, hey, this ain't just understanding it. 
it's having it change you from the inside out. And that's what um, all scripture, including Chronicles, which again, I don't know the last time maybe you've showed up at a church, any church, and he says, today open your Bibles, we'll be in Chronicles chapter 10. <laughs> now they'll go to Kings because the same stories lie there, but I, don't, I, I can't even think of the last time I've heard someone preach out of Chronicles. Um, but it's profitable, so we need to know that. At first glance, it appears that the book of First Chronicles is simply a repeat of First and Second Samuel, and that Second Chronicles is a repeat of First and Second Kings. But there are some significant differences, right? And so, again, God did not sit around and go, "Boy, I sure would like to figure out a way to get to sixty-six books." Right? Maybe we should take this. And in the Hebrew, um, this is one book. In our English Bible, it's actually divided into two. But we know that everything has purpose with God. Every word, every dot, every comma is in the right spot because God designed it. He didn't leave room for error uh, if we just trust what he did. And what we'll find is Samuel and Kings, they emphasize the historical side of things. So you're going to get the uh, historical account of all of those stories that you, that you read about and that we covered in some previous classes. Uh, Chronicles is going to emphasize it from the spiritual side and how it's impacting both the nation and the people from a spiritual perspective. So, yeah, in the same way, think about that is, you know, you think about, oh man, why did God give us four Gospels? Because he gets to show us through Matthew, hey, in this book I'm going to show you Christ as king to the Jews. And in Mark, you know, I'm going to have Mark tell you about how you should live as Jesus did as servant. And so we're going to see, that's why you don't even see a genealogy in Mark, because servants and slaves, nobody cared about their history. Nobody cared about, cared about where they came from. So it's, just, it's unique that if they're going to present Christ as a servant, well, there's no genealogy, because there's no genealogy needed for a servant. Then you're going to move into Luke, and Luke is going to be a doctor who writes and presents to you Christ as a man, right? His fullness of being human. And then John is going to come along, close those Gospels, and say, you know, now that you understand him as king, servant, and man, now let me reveal to you God as, or Jesus as God. And so it's not just four guys saying, hey, what did you see? I don't know, I saw this, and I saw this. And, yeah, they kind of line up. They're very purposeful, they're very intentful. And so when you read those, and you go to those Gospels, you need to understand Matthew is a book that is heavily represented for a Jewish audience to hear. And then when you move into Mark and Luke, there's reasons why they're speaking so that Gentiles can hear the gospel also. And then everybody learns about how Jesus was God through John the Apostle. Right? So the same thing is going on back here is you see different uh, explanations from points of view. You're going to see historically events that happened for the sake of representing them historically, but then God's going to show you the perspective on these from a spiritual uh, perspective and how it impacted those people and the nation as they dealt with those situations. <clears throat> Samuel and Kings are seen from the human standpoint. Chronicles is seen from the divine. Samuel and Kings are presented from the viewpoint of the prophets, and Chronicles is going to present it from the viewpoint of the priest, again, from a spiritual perspective. Samuel and King show man ruling, and then Chronicles is going to show you how God overrules in those situations. Chapters 1 through 9 uh, in uh, First Chronicles makes up the longest genealogy in the Bible. And if you were to take the time, and I didn't, I just assumed that the author that I got this from was correct, um, that there are over 1,500 names mentioned. Uh, these are people that made a difference, which begs the question, where would I fit in amongst the names? And we do know that God is into knowing people and their place. So he reaccounted these people historically. And where our name is going to matter is when we get saved, you know, it says that our name is put into the book of life. And so we'll see those books unfolded uh, in Revelation when they give an account. We know because we're raptured out of here as the church, but when you have the unsaved lost that are called up to the great white throne. He's a just God. He's going to be like, it's just as simple. You are in the book or you're not. So when he unwraps those books, those people that are at that great white throne judgment, they're going to be like, you're not here because it wasn't about works. And that's what they'll be based on is because the people at the great white throne, all they're going to have is their works. 
to uh, present to God. And obviously we know that works is never going to be enough to satisfy the judgment of God. It's only through what he did through Christ, obviously this Friday and into Sunday. <clears throat> These chapters in our Bible, uh, in our Bible to provide us the historical basis of our faith. The opening chapters of 1 Chronicles and the skeletal framework of the entire Old Testament. They bind the Old Testament together with a, a unified whole, showing that it is in fact history and not merely legend and so or myth. And so what it is, it's giving you separate accounts, because I don't know if you guys have ever gone out and, and studied this, but from a worldly perspective, there is pretty much zero evidence of Solomon reigning and fragmental evidence of, of David, right? If you go study him, Solomon is just a made-up story in the Bible. Now, there were some uh, horse stables and stuff that lined up with how great a horse stables that Solomon had that they did find, but then people came in quickly to say, oh, that couldn't be Solomon's. I don't know the whole story, but from a worldview, you will find that a lot of the stories that surround Solomon and David um, don't exist in our worldview books. And I think, again, I think there's a lot of reason for that. Because the Davidic reign and the Solomon reign are a picture of Christ's reign and a picture of things to come, the best thing the devil could do was find a way to erase them as much as possible because otherwise we can, you know, we can then go and question, well, if they really didn't exist, then that really isn't a good picture of what Jesus' reign will be like. But if you go to the Bible with a faith-based approach and say, hey, you know what? I don't care what the archaeologists say. There's a lot of things this book says that I've chosen to accept. If we accept you, you with this book, you either come to the point where I'm in all or I'm in none. You don't get to pick and choose what makes sense. And so what happens is, you know, just because we're conditioned as little kids, we can buy into Christmas and Easter and you know all those things and all of a sudden those aren't weird that a, a man would get crucified and the earth would shake and uh, Dead men's ghosts would be walking around Jerusalem and then Jesus would arrive all of a sudden well I've known that since I was three not because you've been conditioned But you know we get back to stories like Solomon who was called and we'll see you know the wisest around uh, of all the people to rule and that people from all across the world came to him the same thing um, with Queen of Sheba, again, she's, uh, they can't really track her. As there's some, you know, illusions as to where she may have come from. But again, I really believe that Satan has stepped into history to do what he can to ruin some of God's pictures. <clears throat> from Adam to Abraham, Boaz to Benjamin, the generations are all there in their proper order to show the outworking of God's plan and purpose through the years and in the lives of men and the women of faith. These chapters teach us, if nothing else, that God has a plan for the earth, the universe, Israel, and your life. So in First Chronicles, it's pretty much agreed uh, that Ezra had written these, uh, and that he had written these from what they call the dispersions, um, which is basically just a fancy way of saying while they were in or after captivity. Uh, because they are the same book, you're going to find that the theme uh, runs the same, which is that Christ is king. Most people would believe that you're going to find this written from 410 to 440 B.C. Uh, again, I don't know that it's, it's wildly important as to what date it falls on. Uh, but again, most people would accept that Ezra was the writer of Chronicles. And then in um, Chronicles chapter 1 through 9, you're going to get that genealogy. That's where you get to the book where some people, that is the Rocky Mountains to the West Coast, right? I mean, it's like, all right, Chronicles chapter 1, let's do this thing, right? And so, you know, and then you get through that, and if you can get to chapter 9, you're just like, okay, right, we, we made it, right? We made it. And so, but do keep in mind, like I said, God remembers people. And again, it's, it's as much of a historical count just to prove that the lineage was not just made up, that there's a, a true historical account in record to prove how we moved through generations uh, to get to Christ. In chapter 10, you'll see the final days of Saul. And then in chapters 11 through 29 of 1 Chronicles, you will have um, the reign of David. 
And then you'll move into Second Chronicles, uh, again, written about the same time. Uh, the theme remains the same. And then uh, the key verse in Second, let me do the key verse in uh, First Chronicles, because I did skip that, because I was moving too fast. It says, Thy, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and is in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Again, what we're going to see is that spiritual aspect of God moving in Chronicles. <clears throat> and then Second Chronicles chapter 15. There we go. And he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, and the Lord is with you while you be with him. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. Again, that would not be a New Testament directive, because we know he shall never what? Leave me, nor forsake me. Right? And so we have to ask ourselves, um, does that apply to the New Testament church, that statement? Uh, you know, that's, that's